Hope. I'm Bianca Fischini, filling in for Christian Bryant. Coming up in the show, a U.S. senator weighs in on the rampant robocalls blowing up our phones and what the government can do to help put up a filter. Then, new developments in a migrant crisis in Eastern Europe with global implications. We're explaining what's going on and why it matters. Last year, the FBI reported the highest number of hate crimes the U.S. has seen in over a decade. Tonight, activists and concerned community members from coast to coast saying enough is enough. Before that, they allegedly yelled anti-Jewish statements outside a synagogue and destroyed the side mirror of a car parked nearby. The Department of Justice defines a hate crime as a violent crime that was committed based on bias. They also define hate incidents, which are acts of prejudice that are nonviolent. In October, the FBI released updated data showing that there were over 8,000 hate crimes reported in 2020, and experts say there could be more that aren't on record. The reports show that 62% of these crimes were motivated by race and ethnicity, 20% by sexual orientation, and 13% by religion. It also showed that hate crimes against black people have seen the largest rise out of all groups in the year following a racial reckoning and worldwide Black Lives Matter protests. Verbal and physical attacks against Asian Americans have also spiked since the pandemic began. Stop AAPI hate recorded a rise between April and June of this year from 6,600 to a little over 9,000. The group says public comments related to COVID-19 like those from former President Trump, didn't help matters. To be specific, COVID-19, that name gets further and further away from China as opposed to calling it the Chinese virus. It's got all different names. Wuhan. Now, Wuhan was catching on. Coronavirus, right? Kung flu, yeah. But how many of these crimes actually get prosecuted? A DOJ report shows that between 2005 and 2019, federal attorneys prosecuted only 17% of hate crimes. Insufficient evidence is listed as the most common reason cases are declined for prosecution. We spoke with attorney Stanley Marr, who works with victims of anti-Asian violence, and he explained why these cases are so difficult. The difficulty is when you have a mixed motive you know, motivation and intent under criminal law are really different uh, ide ideas. Motivation may be, you know, why a person um, might want to attack this person or commit a crime against that person. That might be something, you know, cir more circumstantial. But the act of the crime itself has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt if you're you know, going for a conviction. Mark turns to the Atlanta spa shootings as example, where eight people were killed, six of them Asian women. He says it starts with the investigation and that bias cannot be ruled out immediately as a motive. They're trying to make it a mixed motive case. And people, at least in the Asian American community, we know it was a crime. And frankly, if you're not looking for, for it, in an investigation, you're not gonna find it. In May, President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which addresses the rise of hate through the pandemic, specifically against Asian Americans. And Attorney General Merrick Garland says he's working to improve the DOJ's efforts to combat these types of attacks. From improving data collection and incident reporting to providing resources in languages other than English, the Department of Justice is committed to this mission. But what more can be done? Advocates like Stanley Mark say it's largely about investing in the community. Building solidarity with other communities, people who share, you know, in all the community sharing that kind of vision, you will help prevent a lot of the issue, prevent a lot of these situations where you have attacks, random attacks. You have to spend more money on mental health, education, housing. It, there, there's no uh, way around that. One other piece of this national rise in hate crimes comes against Jewish Americans. New violence between Israel and Hamas this spring corresponded to a rise in acts of anti-Semitism worldwide. The Anti-Defamation League reported in March that they received reports of nearly 200 anti-Semitic incidents in the week after the crisis began. They also tracked more than 17,000 tweets between May 7th and 14th using the phrase, Hitler was right. Newsy's Amber Strong visited a college campus to investigate how anti-Semitism is rising on campuses across the country and what can be done to push back. 
we're a very prominent place. Um, we have security cameras for a reason. Um, it's just, it's not who we are. We're not going to hide. Rabbi Yudi Steiner is the director of the Center for Jewish Life at George Washington University, a school that boasts one of the largest Jewish populations of any in the U.S. On any given night, Rabbi Steiner hosts about 150 students from here on campus for dinner and conversations about Judaism. 150 students come for a family um, experience, uh, an experience of belonging and of cultural identity. So it makes sense that when a fraternity was vandalized and a copy of the Holy Torah doused with detergent, he was one of the first calls. There's a text message that was sent, I think, at about 2.30 from this Jewish student in the fraternity. Rabbi, the Torah has been desecrated. I'm not going to bed until you tell me what I need to do. He showed us that Torah copy that's now being kept at the campus synagogue until proper disposal. The Yud and the He and the Vav and the He, that's the, the, the four-letter ineffable name of God. And so it's there, and when you have a name like that, you don't just dispose of it. While this particular incident is still under investigation and Steiner urges students not to jump to conclusions, researchers say reports of anti-Semitism on college campuses are on the rise. If students will wake up and they'll walk down the hallway of their dorm room or from their dorm room and they'll see there's a swastika on the wall. We heard of from, from many people who reported having somebody do a, a Nazi salute towards them. According to data from the American Jewish Committee, 50% of Jews over the age of 18 believe anti-Semitism has increased on college campuses. A separate study from the Anti-Defamation League says 43% of Jewish college students say they experienced and or witnessed anti-Semitic activity in the last year. When you think of modern examples of anti-Semitism, far-right ralliers marching through Charlottesville may come to mind. According to the ADL, Jewish students report a nearly equal concern of the political left and the political right. When it comes to the far right... Jewish control for, of the media, Jewish control over the banks, Jewish control of universities. And when it comes to the ideological far left. This isn't folks wearing hoods and, and marching through Charlottesville. This is folks saying, I don't want Zionists or Jewish students who support Israel part of my club. I don't think they belong on campus. Jeffrey Herbst, who has been the president of both secular and non-secular universities, says pro-Israel students should be open to debate. I don't think it's appropriate to immediately say you're anti-Semitic. You may get there, but you can first say, you know, you've got your facts wrong or that's just not correct without um, invoking what is, you know, what is kind of a sledgehammer. In a recent op-ed, he encouraged fellow university leadership to get ahead of potentially heated debates by inviting a variety of speakers to campuses. He also encouraged them to be proactive about potential threats. Sometimes colleges overlook anti-Semitism as an issue in climate because of the perception that it's either not much of a problem or a perception that Jewish students are well ensconced and comfortable. Back at GW, Steiner says he's doing his part to expose more people to the Jewish culture to and pride, um, leading Jewish students in a march across campus days after the incident. We walked outside and it was time to start. And there was just a sea of people. And that's all we needed to know. We needed to know that the overwhelming majority of GW students support and love and are sending a very clear message that this will not happen on this campus. He's encouraging students to focus on the other side of the statistics, like the hundreds of fellow students who marched in solidarity. And if society needs something more today, it's not only, there's my caveat, to be aware of the hate, but it's to be aware of the life-affirming love in yourself, in your neighbors, in everyone. Talk to people. Spread love. Amber Strong Newsy, Washington. Thanks for that, Ember. Up next, it's trending time. We're hitting on a few topics that you may have seen on your social media feeds today. More on that when we're back. What do you think the future looks like? From Newsy, renowned journalists and filmmakers, comes a celebration of storytelling. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? When the suspect admits to it, I'm not going to argue the, the law with you. <sighs> New features every week. Newsy Docs presents Sunday nights at 9, 8 central, only on Newsy.
We know you're pretty busy and sometimes it's tough to keep up with what's making some buzz, but that's where we come in. Here's our rundown of what's trending online. A record number of Americans died by drug overdose during the COVID-19 pandemic. From April 2020 to April 2021, over 100,000 people died, up almost 30% from the period prior, according to the National Center for Health Statistics. Experts say this happened due to several factors, like limited access to treatment and an increase in mental health issues. They also point to the rise in fentanyl, the powerful and fast-acting opioid that's often unknowingly mixed in with other drugs. To counter the surge, the Office of National Drug Control Policy said it plans to increase access to naloxone, which can reverse opioid overdoses. The FCC voted unanimously Thursday to require text messages sent to the number 988 to be routed to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by the middle of next year. The move follows a decision last year to standardize 988 as an emergency phone number to reach the hotline. Some advocates worry the line might not be able to handle a major increase in capacity and are calling for more funding and resources. But the hope is that enabling texts will make it more accessible to young people and vulnerable LGBTQ Americans. The requirement for phone providers to route calls and texts to the line takes effect on July 16th. Callers can also reach the lifeline by calling 1-800-273-8255. There's been a resurgence in monarch butterflies along California's central coast. It's worth noting, especially since their presence is typically an indicator of environmental health. Last year, the number of monarchs fell to a record low, which experts say was the result of climate change. Since the 1980s, the Western monarch butterfly population has declined by more than 99%. But researchers are cautiously optimistic about what they'll find at the end of the count, which will last for three weeks. These past weeks, Newsy has been following the trial of Travis and Gregory McMichael and William Bryan for the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. On Thursday, Travis McMichael took the stand for cross-examination from prosecutors. It's been an emotional, tense time for Arbery's loved ones and those in the community of Brunswick, Georgia, where Arbery was killed February of last year. Newsy's partners at the Washington Post shows us what this trial has been like for Ahmaud Arbery's parents. God, these are hard days that we cannot walk without you. There are things that take every bit of what we have inside us and strip it away. And we only find the ability to continue because you love us and stand with us and give us your strength. Preparing for the trial, I was very anxious, still anxious, but I'm thankful because early on, back in the, the winter of 2020, I never imagined that we would have a trial date. More than a year after Arbery was killed, the trial for the three white men charged in his death is underway in Brunswick, Georgia. For his parents, it's another opportunity to seek clarity after their son's passing. Initially, the district attorney concluded that the men did not commit a crime, but a leaked video changed that. I often think that if there wasn't a video, we would have a trial, because in the beginning, the Glen County Police Department also, all three, all three defendants was giving a totally different narrative. Cooper Jones, who's been attending every day of the trial, says it's been hard to sit through due to the conflicting details she was initially told about her son's death. February 23rd, um, 2020, I received a phone call on my cellular phone that came across as a unknown caller. I was hesitant about answering it, and I answered. The caller on the line identified himself as um, Investigator Lowry from Glen County Police Department. He went on to say that Ahmad was involved in a burglary. There was a confrontation between Ahmad and the homeowner, and there was a wrestle over the firearm, and unfortunately, Ahmad was shot and killed. Here, here in the testimony from that same lead investigator who called to give me that disturbing news, in his testimony of say four hours, he never disclosed that Ahmad had committed a burglary. Very, very disturbing because that's what he told me 18 months ago. For Marcus Arbery, Ahmad's father, seeing the men charged with his son's killing in court has been one of the most difficult moments of the trial. To sit back and look at those three men that murdered my kid, Langston, that's hard. When you know you kid been racially lynched by three white men that are racist, it's hard, just looking at those men. 
On most days, pastors and family members have joined Cooper Jones and Arbery for emotional support. He was hunted, chased, attacked, Ooh. murdered, and lynched. Ooh. And because of that, this family and the entire family of justice, these lawyers, Barbara and Crump, and all of them cannot rest until justice comes. Yes. yes. When you see your baby kid going down like that, you just never imagine nothing like that to happen in this little town like this here. And you know, I, 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 I dealt with some stuff as growing up and as got a man, being a man, but I never imagined it to bother my children. Both of Ahmad's parents want the world to remember the type of person he was and not to be solely remembered by his last moments alive. I heard one of the potential jurors just describe him as a jokester, and that was his personality in a nutshell. If a mom was in your presence for five minutes, you, you would walk away with, I love this kid. He just was a nice human being. I just want everybody to know Ahmad Sorry. was a good young man, never was disrespectful, and all old men had to do is talk to them. But you don't go talk to no kid, tell me you're going to blow his head off. They got to understand Ahmad was a young kid. 25 years old, he began to live his life, and they robbed him of his life. Many thanks to the Washington Post for that story. We have to take a quick break now, but when you're back, we'll have a follow-up to our recent story about spam robocalls, with more on how Congress is trying to take action. It's time to see the bigger picture. Widen the lens. Narrow the divide. We must love and support one another! That support is shifting, and it's shifting toward concern for climate. It's about the whole community stepping up to help. Not everything is left or right, good or bad. The human capacity for change is so inspiring. It's time to look closer at the whole story. A hurricane don't care what your color is or how much money you make. It affects us all. It's time to ask why. The whole goal is to point people to something bigger. Introducing a new point of view. Yours. Newsy. Watch free 24-7. We're gonna take a trip to the other side of the world now where things have been escalating on the border between Poland and Belarus. Poland has been reportedly sending troops to the border. Russia recently flew a couple of warplanes in Belarusian airspace, and tens of thousands of migrants were caught right in the middle in no man's land. As of this morning, the camps have been cleared as some migrants have been flown back to Iraq by the Belarusian government. Others are now sheltering in a government warehouse in Belarus, waiting to see what's next. So. How did the crisis unfold in the first place? First, let's back up to where this story starts in the summer of 2020. In August of 2020, President Lukashenko of Belarus won another presidential election that many independent observers say was rigged. Opposition leaders were jailed or exiled, and the government reported he won by 80%. Largely peaceful protests against the election were met with violent crackdowns and internet shutdowns that drew international backlash. The EU imposed a number of economic sanctions and travel bans against Belarusian leaders. Then in June of this year, a commercial airplane carrying journalist Roman Protasevich was diverted from Lithuania to land in Belarus, where he and his girlfriend were arrested. The EU imposed even more sanctions after that, and in response, Lukashenko declared he would no longer agree to secure the borders from asylum seekers. Fast forward to last week, there was an uptick in the number of migrants from primarily the Middle East and Asia who have been trying to cross the border from Belarus into Poland. Poland has now shut its border, leaving thousands of migrants stranded on the Belarus side, some in freezing conditions as we head into winter. At least eight migrants have already died. Each side is, of course, blaming the other for the crisis. The EU and Polish government are accusing Belarus of encouraging migration on this route, which has only recently become popular, with false promises of European visas to travelers and easy access to Poland. Some reports from migrants that were there have confirmed that Belarusian authorities funded and transported many of them to the border, even occasionally cutting down parts of the fencing for them. Belarusian authorities have also reportedly beaten travelers who turned back from the border. Some political analysts believe President Lukashenko is either taking revenge for the EU sanctions, trying to pressure the EU into negotiations, or both. Meanwhile, Poland has been sending more and more troops to the border and preventing journalists from observing. Belarus has also increased its defenses, 
and Russian warplanes have flown across the airspace in what some say is military posturing. Although most of the migrants are reportedly no longer trapped at the border, European leaders have expressed concern that this crisis is far from over. While we wait to find out the fate of these migrants, all eyes are now on Belarus and the tense showdown between the EU and Russia. For more on Russia's role in the standoff and to tell us where Russia and Belarus may go from here, we go to Julia Chapman reporting from Moscow with the latest. For days now, these men, women and children have been caught between competing political interests. They've been stuck in Belarus, the EU, within touching distance. But Europe won't let them in. Officials on the other side of the razor wire say authorities in the Belarusian capital Minsk are using these migrants to put pressure on Brussels. We're not collecting refugees all over the world and bringing them to Belarus, as Poland has informed the European Union. Those who come to Belarus legally, we accept here, the same way any other country would. Those who violate the law, even in the slightest, we put on a plane and send back. Belarusian officials have now cleared migrants from a closed border crossing where they had been camping. They want the world to know they won't let these people die. The government accuses the EU of a dereliction of duty. Russia is helping it push that narrative. Today we see not a trace of the champions of human rights. There are sharp, cold, even primitive, and in many instances inhuman calculations about how to beneficially and correctly, from their point of view, resolve the situation to their advantage. This isn't even about human rights. This is about human life and health. Poland, an EU member state, has accused Russia of masterminding this crisis. But analysts believe the Kremlin was caught out by recent events. Few others recognize Alexander Lukashenko as the rightful president of Belarus. That gives Russian President Vladimir Putin leverage and leaves Lukashenko craving legitimacy. So if it is the case, uh, what does he uh, need this legitimacy for? I think that uh, the only logical uh, suggestion would be that uh, he needs this legitimacy uh, in order to distance himself from Moscow, uh, in order to overcome uh, this uh, dependence on Moscow that we observe today. President Lukashenko may not have the EU's recognition, but he does have its attention. Lines of communication closed for the last year have been reopened. But the bloc is still preparing further sanctions against Minsk. Brussels says the Lukashenko regime needs to be held accountable for using people for political purposes. But sanctions will have the added consequence of pushing Belarus back into Russia's arms. Minsk may or may not have had Moscow's blessing for its actions, but it certainly has its backing. Julia Chapman for Newsy, Moscow. After the break, we're heading back stateside to tell you what rising sea levels could mean for our roads. Why do we have bureaus in Missoula, Nashville, and Tulsa? Because we want to tell the whole story. When you look at it from your child's perspective, they don't see the world the way we do anymore. And elevate voices from all over the country. There are times when you're just trying to keep your head above the water. We believe that people are at the heart of a good news story. So you've lived in this area all your life? Oh my life. We're in the midst of an amazing revolution. It's probably going to be the biggest challenge of all. It's through their eyes that we gain perspective and better understand how news impacts them. Technology is changing, but you can't kill love. It's about the whole community stepping up to help. And how it affects you. Newsy. Watch free 24-7. Welcome back to In The Loop. You may have seen our recent look at the rise of spam robocalls. The problem has grown dramatically in the last few years, with tens of billions of robocalls now made to Americans every year. And while there are regulations like the FTC's Federal Do Not Call Registry and the FCC's Stir Shaken Call Verification Program, agencies are still struggling to handle the problem with the tools they have. We spoke to Margot Saunders, 
senior counsel to the National Consumer Law Center, and a consumer privacy advocate who urged action from Congress to give regulators more options to stem the problem. There is a big issue that still that will be pending in Congress over whether the there needs to be more tools. And to the extent that people are bothered by these calls and they continue to be harassed, people should think about contacting their members of Congress of both parties and saying, please do something about robocalls. In recent years, Congress has acknowledged the problems around robocalls and taken up legislative efforts in response. In 2019, then-President Trump signed the TRACED Act into law. That legislation gave more power to the FCC to respond to robocalls. And senators from both parties have been working on new legislation that goes further to fight fraud and spam by phone. Joining us now is Senator Mike Crapo. He's a Republican from Idaho and one of the lead sponsors of the bipartisan DART Act, which proposes giving the FCC more power to block robocalls. Senator Crapo, thank you for joining us. I want to start off by talking about the limitations that experts warn make it hard for regulators like the FCC to prevent robocalls, especially if they're made abroad. So how can this legislation you're proposing help the FCC do more to stop these calls? Well, it does it in two or three ways. Uh, One of the problems is the technology for call blocking. And I'm not talking about what people have on their cell phones to block calls. I'm talking about what the provider, the telephone provider company has in order to identify uh, calls or specifically calls where there's already been a complaint filed or to help figure out what is uh, an an inappropriate call or a robocall and then be able to block it. We don't have the actual technology in place across most of the industry yet. And one of the things this does is to expand the adoption and ability to adopt call blocking technology. The next thing it does is to focus on making sure that that technology does not block out critical safety and emergency calls, things like government calls or emergency calls or even school calls to parents or weather calls and things like that. The emergency calls need to be uh, protected and we need to make sure the technology does that. And then finally, the, the other thing that the legislation does is to assure that Congress has an expanded role in oversight of this to make sure that we focus on facilitating it as we need to with policy and overseeing the adoption by the FTC of these critical reforms. So even if this uh, technology and and these rules are enacted, what about enforcement? What specific mechanisms are you proposing the FCC and other federal agencies use to enforce penalties against these callers that are under U.S. jurisdiction, of course, or perhaps might make it easier for consumers hurt by these calls to sue? The DART Act, which Amy Klobuchar and I introduced, uh, does not focus on enforcement. But the reason for that is mainly that the legislation that I sponsored last Congress and that is now law called the TRACED Act, that's T-R-A-C-E-D, is one that mandates the adoption of this critical technology that our act helps to make a reality, but then increases the penalties for violating anti-robocall statutes in the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that is already in place. So the technology is needed, but the enforcement activities are already well authorized and in place with the FCC. Your bill did pass unanimously in the Senate last December, but the House wasn't able to pass it before the end of last Congress. And then you and Senator Klobuchar reintroduced it in February, but it still hasn't passed in either chamber. So why do you think this bill isn't moving forward? And can voters expect to see this bill pass eventually? I believe voters should expect to see it pass this Congress. And uh, Amy Klobuchar and I are pushing hard to make that happen. Obviously, we had unanimous support last Congress. We should be able to pass it expeditiously in the Senate. Uh, And I believe the same should happen in the House. The reason that you haven't seen much activity yet in this Congress is primarily because of the aggressive agenda of the administration on these multi-trillion dollar bills. They started out with using reconciliation, which is a process that avoids the filibuster and passing the uh, $1.9 trillion COVID-19 package. And now they are pushing on two packages Uh, a a real infrastructure package that has passed but was limited and did not have to use reconciliation, and a three and a half trillion dollar bill that's getting pared back more and more as they try to cram it down. But this process has literally taken all the oxygen out of the room, if you will, for most other legislation. Is there anything else you would like to add? 
I want to tell you that I'm very glad that you're focusing on this robocall issue. And um, my hope is that we can help people understand how critical it is that we deal with this. Uh, you probably have the statistics already, but this is the number one complaint that the FCC receives from people across America. It's the number one priority of the FCC to deal with. And uh, we are seeing thousands and thousands of complaints coming from Idaho uh, every year on this. This is a critical issue that the people of America are fed up with, and they want to have Congress and the FCC deal with it. We're going to do so. Well, best of luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Crapo. This was really helpful. Thank you. Good to visit with you. The rise of automation can mean a lot of things, from the rampant robocalls we've been talking about to something a bit more science fiction, like autonomous weapons on the battlefield. Newsy is diving deep into documentary stories every Sunday night with our Newsy Docs Presents Showcase. This weekend, we're bringing you an on-the-ground look at new technology that's shaping the future of warfare. Here's a clip from our documentary, Tomorrow's War, that looks at the ethical questions around putting battlefield decisions into the hands of machines. Take a look. The Terminator series is fun to watch and it's, it's thought provoking. Um, in fact, the, the problem we have with autonomous weapons has nothing to do with them turning evil or turning conscious. It's, it's just that what an autonomous weapon is, uh, is a weapon that can kill people without individual human supervision of each attack on humans. If you don't have to have individual supervision, uh, then you can do as much of it as you want, uh, simply by buying more hardware and launching weapons by the thousand or the million. Uh, you can cause uh, damage on a scale that previously only nuclear weapons could achieve. Uh, anonymous assassination services would become widespread uh, all the way up to attacks on the genocidal scale. Nuclear is obsolete take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. I thought then, yeah, we, this is what we need for autonomous weapons. We need a short film that illustrates why autonomous weapons are a bad idea. What life would be like if these weapons are developed and sold in, uh, on a large scale? It used to be that uh, you know, if you wanted to kill millions of people, the only way you could do it would be to be a nation state. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we have a whole system of international controls to keep nation states from doing that. Um, and we try very hard to keep nuclear weapons out of the hands of anybody but a small number of nation states. So with autonomous weapons, that changes. ISIS, uh, at some point, I believe, had a revenue of about a billion dollars a month. So that buys 20 million autonomous weapons a month. Uh, so you would see the possibility that non-state actors, for the first time, uh, could be wielding weapons of mass destruction uh, against nation states. That full documentary airs this Sunday at 9 Eastern, anywhere you watch Newsy. But for now, we're jumping over to Eastern Europe, where tensions at a border have been escalating and tens of thousands of migrants have been caught in the middle. When the rain is coming down hard while you're driving, you may be worried about hydroplaning. But in some places, roads covered in water are the norm. And that makes road maintenance a little difficult. In Key West, Florida, rising sea levels could leave some of the roads completely inoperable. National correspondent Maya Rodriguez explains how climate change plays a major factor and what the area is doing to find solutions. where the ocean meets the land in Florida's southernmost county. You know, we're an island community. The sea is both friend and foe. And we have so many miles of shoreline where the tidal waters can readily come in. But we put up the Tiger Dam to stop the flooding. Rhonda Haig is Chief Resilience Officer for Monroe County, home to the Florida Keys. We have over th about 311 miles of local roads that the county maintains. 
But lately, maintaining those roads hasn't been easy. We've been pumping the last three, four days, so the water has gone down. Seawater on the roads here is no longer uncommon, especially in the fall months when the so-called king tides rush in right into neighborhoods. It's been known as a nuisance, but when it gets to that level of water and it's on for a tremendous period of time, it's no longer a nuisance. It's a real problem. The majority of roads here may become inoperable within the next 30 years because of climate change related flooding. Roads in the Florida Keys may be susceptible to rising seas, but they're hardly the only ones. Coastal communities may be susceptible to climate change, but so are roads in inland communities. We've spent our entire time looking at flood risk. Matthew Eby heads the nonprofit First Street Foundation, which just released its first multi-year massive study examining how climate change will impact infrastructure in every county in the U.S., including roads. So when we look at roads, we take 100 uh, meter segments, so small chunks of roads across the entire country, and we look at the elevation of that road and then the likelihood of water to actually pond on that road. And if it's over six inches of water, that's the definition of an impassable road. They found the highest level of flooding threat is for roads in coastal Louisiana and Florida, as well as inland counties in Kentucky and West Virginia. The cities considered most at risk include New Orleans, Miami, and Tampa. Overall, their analysis shows that 23% of the nation's roads, about 2 million miles, will be considered inoperable within three decades because of flooding from either sea level rise or additional rainfall due to climate change. Events of the past are not the same as they are today, nor will they be in the future. And our sewer systems are not built to have all that water flow in all at once. Now the hard part is, how do you fix it? But not just for today. How do you fix it knowing what tomorrow is going to be like? It's what Rhonda Haig is confronting back in the Keys. So these are some really sticky questions that we're going to have to resolve here in the next year. Elevating the roads here will cost $1.8 billion dollars. Money they, like other communities, will need from federal and state governments and from the people who live there. We're doing our planning. We're letting the community know what's coming. We're very forthright about that. And we're also very forthright in letting them know there is going to be some costs and you have to, you know, work together. As they face a future where water becomes an even more familiar sight here. In Key Largo, Florida, I'm Maya Rodriguez. We're bringing it back to the supply chain yet again, a story that's affecting so many parts of our lives right now. And I hope you got all of your holiday shopping in because things are still a little bit backed up. Stores aren't getting their inventory in time, which means it's taking longer to get those products to customers, and customers like you and me will probably have to pay a little bit more. National correspondent Usher Qureshi gives us the latest on that and tells us what you can do to get ahead of it. Right now, products remain trapped at ports with docked ships unable to unload goods as they wait for truckers to keep the supply chain moving. The bottleneck means retail businesses are waiting to fulfill increasing demand as the holiday shopping season gets underway. Prices are going to skyrocket. They are going to go up. Dennis Consorte is a small business consultant with Digital.com. He says specialty stores and grocery stores will be hit the hardest with 3 in 10 predicting 60 to 90 percent less inventory than usual. There's going to be shortages of inventory. There are going to be shortages across all different sectors of the economy. And ultimately, we're going to pay for it. As a result, the majority of retailers say they will be forced to pass those costs on to consumers already dealing with the largest rise in inflation in three decades. According to a recent Digital.com survey, 53% of small business owners anticipate inventory shortages through the 2021 holiday shopping season. As a result, 58% of retailers say they plan to raise prices by 40% or more. For example, chicken breasts, instead of maybe paying three or four bucks a pound, you might be looking at four or five, six bucks a pound. So start thinking about what this means and start budgeting accordingly. A couple of things you can do, shop early before demand overtakes supply. And Consorte says consider gift cards instead of products. Buy a gift card and give it to somebody. They can hold on to that until the prices come down and then they'll get more value for that money. But that may not help when it comes to sticker shock on certain products. The onset of the pandemic set off a panic buying spree. Everything from toilet paper, gaming consoles, organizing supplies and air fryers were wiped off the shelves. 
those prices are going up too, where instead of spending maybe 10 bucks a month on toilet paper, you could be spending 15, 20 bucks a month on it. Diapers, same thing. Uh, and groceries are going to be going up too. Consorte says retailers have to take an active role in fending off a frenzied shopping season. Start thinking about sourcing domestically because then you don't have to deal with all of the international supply chain issues. That may actually be a solve. And start thinking about uh, where else you can source. With inflation already causing a pain in the wallet, the frustrations of not being able to find what you need on the shelves could become very real for millions of consumers. So as always, it's best to plan ahead. I'm Asha Qureshi reporting. Now is the perfect time to give us a shout out on social media using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. We'll be back in a few. Before we wrap up for the night, we're taking it back to two of our top stories. Up first, we covered the rise in hate crimes in the U.S. In October, the FBI released updated data showing that there were over 8,000 hate crimes reported in 2020, and experts say there could be more that aren't on record. The reports show that 62% of these crimes were motivated by race and ethnicity, 20% by sexual orientation, and 13% by religion. But how many of these crimes actually get prosecuted? A DOJ report shows that between 2005 and 2019, federal attorneys prosecuted only 17% of hate crimes. Insufficient evidence is listed as the most common reason cases are declined for prosecution. We spoke with attorney Stanley Mark, who works with victims of anti-Asian violence, and he explained why these cases are so difficult. The difficulty is when you have a mixed motive you know, motivation and intent under criminal law are really different uh, ide ideas. Motivation may be, you know, why a person um, might want to attack this person or commit a crime against that person. That might be something, you know, cir more circumstantial. But the act of the crime itself has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt if you're you know, going for a conviction. Then we traveled to the other side of the Atlantic to look at the developing situation at the Belarus and Poland border and growing tension between the EU and Russia. Poland has been reportedly sending troops to the border. Russia recently flew a couple of warplanes in Belarusian airspace, and tens of thousands of migrants were caught right in the middle in no man's land. As of this morning, the camps have been cleared as some migrants have been flown back to Iraq by the Belarusian government. Others are now sheltering in a government warehouse in Belarus, waiting to see what's next. Each side is, of course, blaming the other for the crisis. The EU and Polish government are accusing Belarus of encouraging migration on this route, which has only recently become popular, with false promises of European visas to travelers and easy access to Poland. Some reports from migrants that were there have confirmed that Belarusian authorities funded and transported many of them to the border, even occasionally cutting down parts of the fencing for them. Belarusian authorities have also reportedly beaten travelers who turned back from the border. Although most of the migrants are reportedly no longer trapped at the border, European leaders have expressed concern that this crisis is far from over. That's it for this episode of In The Loop. We'll be back same time, same place, every weeknight at 9 Eastern. For more on the day's top stories and headlines, keep it right here on Newsy. Mm -hmm.